All right, good morning, good morning everyone. Let's get started with business analytics and data science. Very exciting topic on today's agenda. Um, we will briefly but still uh, look a bit more into the theories underlining our, our endeavors in the scope of data science and we talk about statistical learning, and in particular, some of the challenges that we typically face whenever we build analytical models and trying to use them for getting insights from data. Well, more on that in a minute, just to revisit where we, where we are. From, let's start with our quick recap of the last week. Oops, here's our recap. So what we've done so far uh, is to talk a bit about predictive models. We've seen a couple of, let's say, simpler types of models. And especially in the last week, we have elaborated on how we can evaluate these models, how we can measure their adequacy specifically from the angle of predictive accuracy. In a nutshell, we said that there are two key ingredients to assess a predictive model or to measure the accuracy of a predictive model, which were, on the one hand, processes to simulate a real-life application of the model. And we have looked into the split sampling method and cross-validation as standard choices for these task. And the second ingredient was simply ways to quantify accuracy and to define what we mean by predictive accuracy. In this regard, we have looked briefly into standard measures to assess regression models, including mean square error, mean absolute percentage error. We also talked briefly about R square. And then we have looked a bit more closely into classification models, discussing the confusion table, which was the four field matrix with model predictions, model predicted classes, and actual class memberships. We have also looked into thresholds and then RUC, a receiver operating characteristics analysis as a, let's say, better way to assess classification models better than a single confusion table. That was basically last week. So by now, we are uh, very well prepared to process data, build some models, and judge their quality, predictive models in particular. And today, as indicated, I would like to look a bit more deeply into the underlying principles of these models and what specific modeling challenges arise. We will, following a brief introduction, revisit logistic regression as the type of workhorse method in industry, the gold standard still used a lot, perhaps the most used model uh, there is. For predictive models, I'm sure this is the case. And then the uh, next part, looks into some challenges that we face with logistic regression, but also with decision trees and any other type of prediction model. The curve of dimensionality is maybe a term that you have came across. Otherwise, no worries, we'll look into it. Overfitting, a term that you, in fact, have used several times in answers to my questions. So we want to look into overfitting as well. And the bias variance trade-off also, it's a little bit of theory that helps us to understand the obstacles in predictive modeling. But let's get started. So um, let's actually get started with um, Bayes and Bayes' famous theorem. It's probably the most famous or most important theorem in analytics. And you have been introduced to Bayes' theorem or Bayes' rule as a formalism to work with conditional probabilities. That is just uh, 
a way to write down Bayes' rule using conditional probabilities of two events, x and y. That mimics our setting surprisingly well, our setting in predictive modeling or our setting in classification, in that we also have a y, an event, specifically y is the event we are interested in predicting. For example, whether a customer defaults on a loan and turns out to be a bad credit risk, or whether a customer decides to quit a business relationship with a service provider and insurance. We have these binary events which we are interested in predicting, and I denote these by y. And then, well, we are not accustomed to thinking about x as an, as an event, we are using x just as a symbol to refer to a data point an observation, a single customer or a single loan applicant, right? And that was our x. But, I mean, if you think about it, x, we use that as a vector. Note this bold face here, trying to be accurate with my notation. x is a vector, and this vector embodies measurements about an individual customer, or the values of the attributes that we, that we have, and if a customer with an age value of 35 and a salary value of 3.5k walks through the door, applies for a loan to buy an apartment where the, the value of this apartment happens to be, let's say, well, it's Berlin, Berlin is expensive, so let's say it's 450,000 euros, and we see this customer with all this, this value, it's, it, we can think of that as an event. It's just an event that a data point with all these values happen to occur. So in that regard, x also is an event. And this is why we can use Bayes' rules to make sense of these two events, x and y, and what we are actually interested in in classification is the green part here, it's called the posterior probability of the event y, let's say that a customer turns out to be a good credit risk, given the attributes, given the attribute values, given x. This is really what every predictive classification model is trying to estimate, either directly or indirectly. That's our goal, so to say. And Bayes' theorem then tells us that we can calculate this posterior probability from three other ingredients. The prior probability of the event y, so the prior probability of customers being a good credit risk, which we could simply estimate from past data looking how many credit applications have we granted and how many of these turned out to be good, or how many of the customers whom we funded turned out to be good customers, good lenders, repaying their debt. That is an estimate of the prior probability. And now we need two other parts. Um, one, the denominator, uh, the prior probability of x, sometimes called the evidence, turns out we don't even need that for the sake of classification, so feel free to ignore, ignore the prior of x. Uh, but we also need a class conditional probability, which I denote in blue here. Probability of a customer with attribute values x occurring with an age of 35 and an income of xk, uh, who happens to happen to be interested in a flat with 450k, etc. What's the probability of this event, this, this, this customer occurring, given that she is a, a good credit risk, given, given y. y is our class variable, so we call that the class conditional probability. So the posterior is what we ultimately are interested in, 
we have the prior of the event or the prior of the class membership. We have the class conditional probability of showing up here in Bayes' formula. And then we have the probability of the event, which, as I said, turns out to be irrelevant for our task of building a classification model. Well, the way I'm introducing the theorem here is that it gives us a sort of, of recipe how we can think of predictive models and also how we can design predictive models. And essentially, Bayes' theorem sketches two different ways we can take. Um, on the one hand, well, let's, let's have it that way. On the one hand, we can try to build a model that directly produces an estimate of the probability we are interested in, the posterior probability of y given x, the posterior probability, customer being a good credit risk, given the values of this customer's attributes. Many models would pursue this objective. Logistic regression is one of them. Decision trees also belong to this family of models. But we could equivalently try to design a model that comes up with a good estimate of the class conditional probability, p of x given y, to then plug this estimate into Bayes' formula, pool it with an estimate of the prior probability of the event, and use Bayes' formula to translate the class conditional probability together with the other factors that show up in the formula into a posterior one. And it turns out that a couple of techniques such as naive Bayes, the naive Bayes classifier, or more advanced versions such as Bayesian networks, but also discriminant analysis techniques pursue this other way. All right, let's revisit this. I mean, obviously, both is a conditional probability, right? Um, from a purely Bayesian perspective, these are just conditional probabilities, you could say. It doesn't matter in which way we state Bayes' rule. We could also rewrite it and then have p of x given y on the left-hand side and put p of y given x on um, the fraction. That's perfectly OK. But in our setting, so I look at this as Bayes' theory in our setting. And by our setting, I mean classification analysis or predictive modeling in the form of classification. There we have a meaning to x and a meaning to y, which, which is that y is the dependent variable, our class variable, good or bad risk, churn or no churn, these type of examples. And x is just the vector of attributes that we gather to describe an individual observation. Because of this meaning that I attach to x and y, this is the form of the of the rule which matters to us. And because of this meaning, the left-hand side of the equation shows p of y given x. y is our class variable. y is our prediction target. We want to come up with the probability of y given the attribute vectors. This is what predictive modeling is really all about. If we maybe go back a little bit further, um, you will recall this graph. Where's my pen? You will recall this graph. I was trusting it so much, expressing my sympathy with this type of picture. So much. It summarizes what predictive modeling is about. It summarizes the relationship between the independent variables, the x, and the dependent variable, the y, how we can observe values for x by gathering data, asking questions to a customer, etc., and how we try to translate these observational data x into a forecast of y, into a forecast of our target, what we cannot observe or cannot observe at the time we need to make a decision. We cannot observe when we decide on a loan whether this loan will be repaid or not. Therefore, we create a prediction, and this is what our setting is. And this is just why this probability matters to us. If we come up with an estimate 
of the probability of y, given the observational data that we have about an individual customer, we have solved our classification problem. We have our forecast. There it is. So Bayes' theorem interpreted in this manner gives us a recipe to carry out forecasting. And then you are right by saying that the blue probability and the red one, there are both conditional probabilities. Um, and in fact, you are also correct in saying uh, none of these probabilities is directly observable and we need to estimate both of them using analytical models, which is also true. The prior P of Y we sort of get for free whenever we have data. But the blue conditional probability, the class conditional probability, we would need to estimate. All I'm saying here is that considering this rule, we observe there are two different ways how we can create a prediction or how we can come up with an estimate of y. I, uh, specifically by, well, using a model that either estimates the posterior probability or the class conditional probability. And this, this labeling also, p of y given x being the posterior and p of x given y being the class conditional probability is absolutely specific to my classification setting where y is the class variable. And therefore I can denote p of x given y as the class dependent probability. Yeah, so it's, it's base rule plus some interpretation of the ingredients. And then this is the top sort of takeaway, these, these two options where analytical models equally pursue option one or option two, and you see some examples here. To be really honest, most of the examples that we focus our attention on belong to option, option one family. They try to estimate directly the posterior probability we are interested in. But this is mainly due to my selection of techniques that we will look at, that I believe to be most relevant from a decision support perspective. Still, you should be aware of the fact that both these options exist and you should also be able to make the connection from models and classification to Bayes' theory, which amongst others also helps us to come up with a theoretical optimum, the Bayes' optimal classifier. In fact, that's something very trivial, but it's important to know this. The base optimal rule for classification, or in brief, the base optimal classifier, we simply state that if we have two events, y equal to 1, y equal to 0, the customer being either a good risk or a bad risk, then we can develop estimates for both these probabilities, p of y equal to 1 given x, and then the inverse of that, and well, the base optimal classifier or rule is just as you say here, we would basically make the classification that is associated with higher probability. It's a no-brainer really if you think about it, right? You have two events, good risk or bad risk. You estimate the probability of bad risk to be 70%. Obviously, the probability of good risk then equates to 30%, so you predict bad risk. Really rather trivial. Importantly, however, if we, if we had accurate estimates of these probabilities, or better to say, if we knew these probabilities for sure, then this gives us a theoretical optimum, how good we can get. In that, sticking to my example, could we, for some reason, asking some oracle, know that the true probability of a given customer being a bad risk equals to 70% and the inverse then is 30%, this issue 70 to 30 tells us that we will never be able with a predictive model to classify loan applicants with perfection. If this is the, if these are the true probabilities, then 
the optimal classifier can have an error no less than 30%. It's bound, it's guaranteed to make 30% errors. Because of the statistical process that underlines the data generation, because of the joint probability between x and y, or of x and y, I should say. And this is, this is really important because if you read machine learning type of papers where many algorithms have been coined, they often do not adopt this probabilistic perspective and try to come up with algorithms that separate the two groups in a data set, the good risk and the bad risk, with perfection. Where a statistician would say, wait a minute, that's nonsense. We will never be able to tell apart the good guys and the bad guys with perfection. There is something like a base error. There is something like a base optimal classifier and there is no way you can do better than that. All right. Um, so we, you can think of predictive models as probability estimation machines, which according to Bayes' rules, you can distinguish into the option one machines and the option two machines. And this gives us a little bit of uh, foundation to think about different types of models. And then we can move on if you agree, if you're happy, or don't reject us moving on and you don't, so we move on with one such probability estimation machine. Um, that's a nonsense term, really. It's one well-known technique, logistic regression, and I know that you've worked with that in the tutorial. So at this point, I can't ask you who has worked with logistic regression, because I know you've done that in our tutorials. Still, I want to revisit some of the foundations of logistic regressions and highlight some aspects of its functioning. Our setting is still that of classification, and we can first of all reason a little bit why we bother with logistic regression and not simply use linear regression in order to construct classification models, which we could construct as shown here using the well-known regression formula. We could state that our class variable y is a parametric function of the attributes x parameterized by beta and then we could estimate beta using OLS given some data with x and y, with observations and their labels. But then we would have some problems because linear regression as any statistical model is based on assumptions and these we would violate. Important assumptions we would violate, for example, the assumptions of equal variance would be violated, the assumptions of normal residuals would be violated, simply because our y is only 0 or 1, but never any value in between. y is not normally distributed. It's just a b-modal distribution, extremely peaked, because there is a peak at the 1, a peak at 0. The height of this will depend on the task and there is no value in between. But what we can do is apply a little trick. Instead of using linear regression natively, we just use our linear regression and plug it into a squashing function or a sigmoid function. All the equations you, show, you see here, um, that guy here is the logistic function. And um, if you plot that function, you will immediately see that its values are bounded by 0 and 1. It can never be below 0, nor can it be above 1, and it displays this characteristic S-like shape. Now, because it's bounded by 0 and 1, we can readily interpret the output of that function as a probability. And the interesting aspect by doing so, in my opinion, would be that this S-shape, right, that actually has a meaning. Here we have a single variable z. Let's accept that for the time being. And the s shape basically says that whenever z is a very large value, relatively large a value, then our probabilities don't change much because 
you see that in this type of interval, if you would kindly accept that in this range, we just say Z is large, the degree to which changes in that translate into changes in our function output is very, very marginal. The function is almost flat, same here in the tail. The function is flat in the tails, which says that the input may change a lot, but the output will change only a little. There is, there is this single area where things are getting interesting. This is where things get interesting, where small values in the input Z translate into larger values in the output Y. Uh, sorry, F of that. And that, I truly believe, is something interesting. If you think of that again in the context of a credit scoring application, and let's say that measures something like the income of a customer, and you want to find out whether this customer is a good or a bad credit risk, if you can lend money, this S shape makes some sense, I believe, because, you know, think about the dependency between income and ability to repay debt. I mean, people may refuse to repay debt for various reasons. Maybe they are fraudsters. But one reason why they might refuse to repay debt is because they are unable to do so. They don't earn enough to repay their debt. So there must be a relationship. Focusing on this type of pattern, the ability to repay debt as captured by income, you can readily make the argument that if you are well off, you are able to repay your debt. So that is a signal for a good credit risk. And if you are even better off, same story. And if you are obscenely rich, same story still. So at some point, you could raise the income further and further and further and further. From a credit scoring perspective, you would have ruled out the possibility that someone is a bad risk because of the inability to repay due to too little income, you just have ruled that out. So it doesn't really matter whether this person happens to earn 2 million a year or 5 million a year or 500 million a year, it doesn't matter that much. Same story with the other end of the spectrum. There is, there is this, this range, obviously it, it relates to the amount that you, that you lend money, but deal with me for the sake of this example, that there is this range where it's really on the edge whether your, your income is large enough to repay this debt in the end. And this is the green range here. This is where things get interesting, where small changes may govern whether you are across the boundary, let's say above a probability of being a good risk equal to 50%, let's say this is the boundary, it's a natural boundary for two events. Small changes in the income can govern whether you are above this threshold or whether you are below this threshold. And this is uh, what I kind of like about these S-shaped functions and the logistic function in particular when we think about probabilistic modeling, which we do in classification. So that thing is handy. We just need to connect it to linear regression. Let's do so simply by um, moving away from Z being a single variable. No, instead, we just make our input to the logit function, our input Z, a function of all the covariates that we know, all our observational data, all our x values. We parameterize these using beta. And this is how we obtain the logistic regression formula. Basically, we plug the linear regression into this logit function. And then we simply state that that is our way to estimate the posterior probability of the class. That's like making an assumption. We make the assumption that we can estimate the posterior probability of somebody being a good credit risk in this manner, through this functional, which is parameterized by beta. That's an informal way to introduce the technique, saying you basically plug linear regression into the logistic function is a bit of an informal introduction. Um, we can play around with this equation a little bit. 
to arrive at a little more formal, a little more formality, because if you write down the ratio of the chances to be good or bad, the odds ratio, what are the odds of somebody being good or bad, if you write that down, plug in the logistic function, you realize that you obtain this exponential, and then if you log that to get rid of the exponent, you essentially recover linear regression, which motivates the statement here, logistic regression essentially is linear regression just with a transformed target variable being the log of the odds. So it's linear regression of the log odds. And this log odds we also call the log it. So you see the similarity to linear regression, it's very strong, and using this transformation of our target, we basically avoid the problem that due to y being discrete, we violate the assumptions of linear regression. The log odds ratio is no longer non-normal. We can model that with a linear regression. Obviously, there is a cost to that. We have to be a bit careful when we interpret the regression coefficients in the logit model. It's no longer possible to extract easily these beautiful elasticities that we know from linear regression. How, for example, a change in a customer's income by one euro would boost the probability of being a, a bad risk. That's something we would like to know, uh, but we can't. We we lose this easy interpretability, the straightforward way to get elasticities because we are no longer modeling default probabilities. We are modeling the log odds ratio. Hence, a change in an input variable x scaled by the corresponding beta value gives us the change in the log odds space. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how you feel, but personally, I have to admit that I have difficulties thinking in a log odd space. The log odds changes by two points. Okay, thanks for telling me. Really appreciate that. Um, so what, right? Um, the interpretation of the beaters is no longer as straightforward. It's still possible. Uh, don't get me wrong here. It's still possible. It's not, just not as easy as linear regression. Useful exercise if you estimate a logistic regression model on data that you know, and by the way, you should always know your data. First thing you should consider is uh, what is the sign of the beta and does this sign make sense? If it's positive, then we know that the, the odds and probability will increase with increases in the x, and same if it's negative. So this gives you a rough check whether the influence of a variable, say, income, your logit model estimates on a target variable, say, credit risk, does make sense or not. That clearly is possible. Elasticities, as said, you don't get as easily. Right, um, in terms of, of estimating the model, it's still this linear function, so estimation still translate into finding values for beta. We can't use OLS anymore, but we use the generalization of OLS, which is maximum likelihood, meaning we set the betas in such a way that given our data sample, the probability of observing this very sample under our model is maximized. And to get your heads around this approach, it may be useful to look at an individual case for start, which we do here, right? So what, what is an, the probability of observing an individual customer with attribute values x? In our setting, we know that this customer can only be of two kinds. It can be a good one or a bad one. These are mutually ex exclusive. And then we can simply spell out, okay, so the probability of observing such a customer would be the conditional probability of the customer being good given x, 
times the probability or 1 minus the probability of the customer being good given x because these events are mutually exclusive and note how we deactivate essentially one of these two terms by the exponent y which I assume to be coded 0 or 1. That's important. Otherwise the whole story does not work out. This is just a formal way to, to write down the customer is even a good risk or the bad risk and depending what it is, the probability of observing the customer will be, uh, will be this way. We can write it as this way or, or write it as that way. <coughs> it's nothing else than that. But then if we think about a sample, that's a collection of customers, many of those. And if we are ready to assume that they are independent, so this means that we are ready to assume that the probability of, of, of me defaulting on a loan is independent from you defaulting on a loan. And you can challenge this assumption, right? You can say, oh, you know, say the university goes, goes bust. City of Berlin says no more funding for HU, so I lose my job, will not be able to repay my debt. You don't get your degree, won't earn a lot of money, won't be able to repay any debt. So maybe there is a dependence because we happen to work for the same organization. Not strictly work, but part, let's say, are part of the same organization. Still, for the sake of model estimation, we will make this assumption, assume there is independence of the event across all the cases. And then the probability of observing one sample is just the product of the probability for one single sample. So this is how we make it to here. And noting this product, we will immediately take the logarithm to get rid of the product and simplify the term a little bit. Here is our functional, our likelihood function, the likelihood of observing our data sample. And this likelihood we want to maximize. This is why we call it maximum likelihood. And the only way we have to maximize this likelihood is by altering the three parameters, which happens to be the beta. And then, of course, we need to plug in our logistic function in order to see the betas in our equation. And this is how we arrive at the very lower part here. And if you are an optimization or R type of person, feel free to call that your objective or call that your cost function. It's a negative of likelihood, therefore you can call that a cost function. Or in statistics, it's more commonly referred to as a loss function. That's what we want to minimize. We want to minimize our loss and thereby we maximize the agreement between our model, its likelihood, and our data sample. And the sample is all we have, so this is the best we can do. And it's a standard type of optimization problem. It's a nonlinear type of problem. You have three parameters, so you can just use some solver some algorithm, say Newton-Raphson algorithm, to find the betas for your training data set. Well, nowadays you would probably want to use something called Adam, which is like the go-to algorithm in the space of deep learning. And as a matter of fact, logistic regression is a very simple, not deep but shallow neural network. Therefore, you could also use this type of solver. But there are standard ways to solve this. That's what I'm saying, right? So no need to worry about that too much. To sum up, or better to, to, to conclude, because we essentially still carry out linear regression, just with a little trick, to account for the fact that our target is discrete, you could also think about the type of classification boundary that you actually construct with your logit model. And it turns out that that's a linear function as well. So this picture still applies, you've seen it before, and it still describes the way in which logistic regression will try to separate your data, namely by, by means of a linear functional, by means of a hyperplane. That's a well-established statistical classifier Okay, to be fair, whether you consider a statistical classifier or a machine learning classifier or a neural network is very debatable, to be really honest. Prevailing opinion, however, would probably be that this is a statistical classifier. Let's not go there. 
Uh, it clearly is a way to implement the recipe of Bayes' theorem, constructing a logistic regression classifier. You can estimate the posterior probability of y. With this, with this model, you can estimate the posterior probability of a customer being a good risk or a bad risk, and having access to these two estimates, you can also approximately construct a base optimal classifier by just guessing the class with higher probability. That connects the parts that we've seen so far. If you compare to linear regression, this is a perfect argument why you are less sensitive or more robust to outliers, because you have this log which embodies a scaling, and it would scale down uh, extreme values compared to just using the raw value. So in this regard, we gain a little bit of robustness. You can, you can still make the point, I believe, that okay, we have the scaling effect of the logistic, of, of the log, of the logarithm. However, this is only scaling, so you soften the effect of an outlier, but uh, you do not get rid of it. So you could also make the point that if there is an outlier which is extreme, or if your data suffers from extreme outliers, you might want to do something about these outliers prior to fitting your logit model, because the maximum likelihood, or the, the likelihood, um, the, the, the negative likelihood, our loss function, will still be impacted, not as much as OLS, but it will be imp impacted. So depending what type of outliers we talk about and what magnitude these have, there might still be a good reason to do something about extreme values prior to fitting the model. But in a, in a strict comparison to linear regression, the logit model clearly wins in terms of robustness with regard to outliers. I count on you having seen this thing in action, seen how easy it is to build such model in R, just one line of piece of one, one line of code. There you go. You have looked at the model output, diagnosing the coefficients, etc. It's all very, very important. We don't want to repeat all that here. All right. Um, good. So then let's move on. We'll come back to logistic regression in the in the reminder. But first of all, let's talk about some of the standard obstacles with predictive modeling. And I trust many of you have heard this, this term, the curse of dimensionality. Dimensionality, it's, it's, it's not only bad, it's a curse, they say. It's really, really bad. Um, first of all, let's, let's agree on the, the meaning of dimensionality. We talk about the number of columns in our data table, how many attributes we have got. The more the more dimensions we have. And this, in fact, follows from this analogy between a data table and a multi-dimensional attribute space. The data point or a row in a data table is a point in a multi-dimensional space which is spanned by our attributes, as in this two-dimensional example, where we have a bunch of data points of two classes and can separate these by means of a line. We can call this a linearly separable classification task in two dimensions. And now, what will happen if I remove one of the dimensions, if I reduce dimensionality? What will happen to my, to my example or my classifier? The data is no longer linearly separable, what will happen to my classifier? It will break down. And, um, well, it's just a little exercise to picture that. You would basically project all the data either to the ordinate or to the abscissa. You would have only access to the values in one of the dimensions, as shown here, I believe. Here, yeah. Okay, so um, that is just to, to exemplify the toy example. But to exemplify that lesser dimensions, reducing the number of attributes, can make your 
classification task more difficult. That's the take home here. We can do it in two dimensions with a line. In one dimensions, we cannot. Okay. Um, what happens in the other case when we add dimensions? <coughs> if we increase dimensionality, what will be the effect of such an increase? Overfitting you're referring to and uh, many other things. So it's, you, you're saying it's more separable. That's one of the things you, you, you said, right? You, you add a dimension and you think the data becomes more separable. The distance between the observation increases. Um, that's a very nice way to, to think about it. Um, and this is also what you said, um, just in a different way, I believe, by, by referring uh, to the point that our data is already easily separable. We just need a line and we can separate the data. Um, but you were saying it's even easier. And that is true. And we can think of the reason for it being easier um, as the one which you kindly gave us, that the distance between the data points will further increase. Further increase means it's even more possible to fit some functional, some line maybe, in between these distances that exist between all the different data points. I was trying to, to picture that as well, and obviously fate failed quite miserably, as always when I try to draw something. Um, arguably, it is a bit hard to see, but I was trying to also visually make the point that both of you made, it will get even easier to separate the data. And I know that is a bit hard to see, so I trust on you believing me um, on, on that. And this sort of gives us more support for the previous example, where we also observed a tendency that the separability of our data increases with dimensions. So it gets easier to solve our classification task. And at first glance, that might sound like good news, because an easy task is a nice task, right? However, sometimes, if something is too easy, there is a risk to it. And it should make you alert that there's maybe something going wrong. And you were also referring to this possibility of something going wrong by uh, mentioning overfitting. If we were continuing this example, adding more and more and more dimensions, obviously I can't plot it anymore. But I can try to picture the consequence of this incremental addition of dimensions. And you were saying the distance between data points increases, which is right. And if it does, if the distance between data points increases, such as paribus, then mm, there, there, there just is more of a vacuum in between the data points. Or as we say, there is more sparsity. The whole space spent by all the attributes is not as densely populated as it used to be in lower dimensions. And this is basically the essence of my, my picture. I still have two dimensions because then I can draw conveniently, but I have only two data points left. And this is to resemble the situation in higher dimensions where you find yourself in a sort of vacuum. Very few data points that are very, very far apart from one another. And this is what we simplified see here. And then you can ask now, what's the optimal classifier in this space? And you see immediately, well, pff, it's hard to tell. You have these three, but in fact, <coughs> indefinitely many classifiers that are alternative to one another. And they are all perfect in that they make no error. They separate the reds and the greens with perfection. There is no error. If you look at it from an optimization perspective, you try to, to, to construct a classifier by minimizing some loss function as in logistic regression. You, you, you do that. All these classifiers give you the same signal. Everything is perfect. No loss. That makes you unable to choose between them unless you bring in a different criteria. <coughs> 
And that is a problem. I, I don't want to go into all the, the details and the, the calculations, how the distances increase. Some of you um, have had the pleasure of doing so. But I'll try to reduce it to the core. I think these are the core points that you need to take home. Um, the curve of dimensionality. So some classifiers, and logistic regression is one example, they estimate multivariate function. Linear regression is a multivariate function, so logistic regression does that as well. Now, to do so with comparable reliability, we require the amount of data to increase exponentially if we add dimensions. To be fair, I did not exemplify this. I just leave it for you to believe or um, research on your own. Um, something that we have seen is that some classifiers, and in fact many, rely on some sort of distance computation. Nearest neighbor classifier is, is one example, but it's to some extent true for logistic regression as well. If you try to separate examples with a line, I mean, there must be some distance in between the borderline cases of the red class and the green class. Otherwise, how would you fit the line through these points? So distances matter. And as you said, they, they increase in higher dimensions between the data points and become indistinguishable. Because the distance between every two data points is so large that it's hard to say one is closer to the other. All classifiers construct a boundary. Finding such a boundary is very hard if most areas of your space are basically empty. This is what we've seen before. That's maybe the most intuitive point here. And um, as you rightfully said, even relatively simple classifiers may overfit when dimensionality is high. Getting there shortly. If you're not comfortable with the term overfitting yet, not to worry. Or in a nutshell, it's, it's bad. And this is why it's a curse. It makes our life hard. Dimensionality. And I hope that you can take with you some intuition why that is the case, considering these visual examples. Some more of these. I have a regression model here, or three of those, with some data depicted by my blue points. And I ask you to decide which of my regression models is the best. The second one you like, model B. Um, why I like B as well, by the way, so just to comfort you a little bit. Um, and with this comfort, you, you might now be willing to explain why you like B. Looking at the data points, we have this type of, of, of uh, nonlinear shape, degressive type of functional shape. And model A does not pick it up at all by fitting just the line, whereas model B picks that up quite nicely. And then we see model C, very erratic, goes wild, up, down, up, down, up, down. Intuitively, at least you and me agree, C is too complicated. That, that's not a good model. And I hope many of you would basically share this opinion. Uh, we can basically make the same example for classification. The plot looks slightly different, but um, I won't ask which model you like better because the answer is the same. This is just the equivalent type of plot where we have three models. For a given data situation, C looks a bit too complicated. We have these points here, a red guy and a green guy. Oh, I should have used green here. Um, and they are so close to one another that we might be willing to judge these points as, as very similar and as inappropriate to determine where the class boundary actually should be because they are so close together. And then maybe you can see something like a quadratic type of shape separating the two classes, and classifier B would sort of pick that up nicely, whereas C um, does not and looks overly complicated. So um, 
that was overfitting in three pictures, or six in total. Let's try to revisit this. Let's try to spill out what we've liked about Model B and what we've disliked about Model C. Um, oh, oh, by the way, one point I forgot, which is important. In, in the classification and in the regression example, although we rejected Model C, right? We rejected classifier C and Model C as well. We reject both despite the fact that they actually are the models with zero error and the only models with zero error. You do have a little residual here, right? To be honest, in the other data points, um, it's hard to spot any residual. In the classification example, it's a bit easier to see here, and the highlighting still works. Our favorite, classifier B, suffers from one classification error, while classifier C, the one we rejected, does not. And again, adopting this optimization perspective, it's model C that is best. This is where we have the minimum loss. It's not model B, it's C. So now we learn, oh, okay, we fit models through optimization, doing something like maximum likelihood of uh, maximization. Yet, if, if this is the only type of measure we put all our money on, if this is the only criterion, we might overlook something very important. We might overlook the fact that our model could be too complicated for the data we have. And that is the overfitting problem, really. We derive our model from the training set, the sample that we have gathered, the data we observed in the past. We have our training set that we gather to build our model. It's, it's this data, really. This is what we have. And you should assume that in your data you find two bits, one is structure and the other is noise. Every sample exhibits random variation. This is why we call it sampling variation. And you have that in your data. And in addition to that, you will have some structure, some patterns that truly exist. There, there is something as a true pattern between your income and your ability to repay debt. And by extension, your tendency to be a good credit risk. There is some pattern. And the task of building a predictive model is really to tell these bits apart, the noise and the structure. The whole point of the exercise is to have a model for novel data, novel customers, for prediction. And we predict future data, customers walking through the door, approaching us next week. But we don't know the, the outcome yet. This is why we predict it. And we must be ready to assume that the structure in the new data is the same as that in the training set. If this, it's more than an assumption, it's really a premise. If that is not the case, uh, we are doomed with all our sophisticated modeling instruments. If the novel data does not incorporate the same structural patterns as our training set, we are doomed. So let's assume we are not doomed. Let's hope for the best. Then, in the novel data, the same structural pattern will, will show up, and our model can capitalize on these structural patterns. I put a term here, and this is generic to the, uh, this, no, this, sorry, this is specific to the revision, and you want to note this term. Um, very bad, but it splits across two lines. Feature response relationship. What's the relationship between a feature or an attribute and my response variable, my target? That's the key type of pattern we care about in predictive modeling. That's the type of structure we hunt with our models. A second type of structure would be the relationship between multiple features. That's also important, but the feature to response relationship is the key thing. And there is a structural relationship, maybe it's linear, maybe it's nonlinear. This relationship we are trying to extract from the data using our model, but it will be superimposed, that's a big word really. Um, it will be corrupted, if you wish, by some 
sampling variation in the training set. We don't get a clear view on the structure. We only see the structure plus the noise. I need to separate the two. Overfitting means our model is so complicated, so powerful, such, such a, a super powerful model that it can fit the training data with perfection, zero error, like model C. Because of that, it also picks up all the noise in the data, which by definition will not be the same, will not show up or not show up in this form in the new data or the deployment data. Having fitted the noise, our model will perform very poorly on the new data because it expects the same noise factors to show up in the new data, which will not be the case. That's overfitting. We are extremely good on the training set, zero error in the extreme case, but only because we model both. We capture both with our model, structure and noise. Because of capturing the noise, we fail on new data. We fail when it matters. Try to come up with a definition, slightly adapted from Wikipedia here. So uh, a model that overfits, I put, is one that achieves low error on the training sample, but gives very high error when used to predict future cases, i.e. unseen data. That's also a way in which you can detect overfitting and check whether it occurred, whether it has, has hurt you. The reason is that the model is too complex for the data at hand. And therefore, for being so complicated, the model has unknowingly extracted some of the residual variation or the noise from the training sample as if that variation represented underlying structure, which it does not. That's, that's overfitting. And I also try to depict that visually again by reproducing the previous chart and adding some novel data. So here we have light blue, which are novel data points. And we see how the novel data points result or produce some large residuals for model A. And we also see how uh, the novel data points are associated with very large residuals in model C. And remember, it's a novel data. So these are forecast errors. This is where we make some prediction, act on that prediction and observe it's entirely off, entirely wrong. So these are the residuals that really hurt us. You sort of um, ask you, but come on, why does the model look so, so weird? Indeed, indeed. Um, my example is stylized and it would be more realistic if I had put some, um, some actual training data point here. And here I should have put it, and, and here. In, in reality, even if we use a complicated model, let's say we use a polynomial of degree 10, a 10th degree polynomial, if there is no data in these points which I added, the polynomial would not come up with such a shape. What we would typically see, however, uh, with a very complicated and overfitting type of model, such as a polynomial, would be such a pattern um, where we maybe again have uh, something like a degressive type of, 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 of slope, and our polynomial orange I need could then, in the range, in the area where there is data, where there is data to stabilize our function estimate, the polynomial could, could still look quite okay, still picking up this tendency. But when we reach a region where there is no data, uh, then it can just go way off. Then it can go bizarre, up, down. So my example is a bit exaggerated, if you wish. But it still conveys the, the, key, the key point of model C being too complicated for the data. And it also depicts here in the second version how this overly complicated model may show some very high forecast errors when applied to new data. And same with uh, the classification example, where a model that puts the boundary in a, a lower density area 
in between the classes, such as classifier B, while accepting some errors on the training data as classifier B, might do better on novel data than classifier C, which in the interest of avoiding any error on the training set, constructed a classification boundary in this high density type of area, part of the space. So these are just pictures meant to exemplify the concept. And we could make this example even more extreme by using a decision tree. This is the, the most extreme example always, a very deep decision tree which has one terminal node for every example in your training set. It has zero error by definition. It will fit the training sample with perfection, but it's so deep and complicated that it will typically perform very poorly when you apply that tree to novel data. You don't have to have zero error to have a problem on the training set, right? Zero error is maybe the extreme, but in tendency, well, you've got this relationship between model complexity and overfitting, I hope. Overfitting problem, too complex a model, fitting not only structural patterns but also noise in the training set. And um, when does this occur? Well, it occurs with complex models. That's, that's one origin of overfitting. But also another origin would be high dimensionality. You said that rightfully, right? Even the linear, cl linear classifier uh, could, could, could sort of overfit. It may be a different type of overfitting. It could do well on the training data, but very poorly on the new data if we have many dimensions. So dimensionality is another source of overfitting. And we can really trace back this problem to building our models, engineering our models in such a way that we minimize error on the training set. Or some people call that, this is a more theory-grounded term, by carrying out empirical risk minimization. That is the broader family of estimation techniques to which OLS and maximum likelihood belong. They ground on the training data and hence the empirical and on the training data they minimize some loss function or some risk function, hence empirical risk minimization. This principle is part of the problem. But this has been realized long ago. So we have regularization, which is a family of approaches to address this problem. Essentially, in a nutshell, you say, OK, if training error minimization is part of the problem, let's not build our models in such a, 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 a unidimensional way, a one-dimensional way. Let's just introduce a second goal into the model estimation. Let's have empirical risk minimization as one goal, but let's add complexity minimization as a second goal. So we want a model that is very accurate on the training set, but also very simple. And you can guess that there is a trade-off between the two. You, you can't have both, but you want both. So since there is a trade-off, there must be something like a sweet spot in between. And regularization uh, tries to find this sweet spot. The key ingredient that we need for regularization is a measure of complexity. How do we judge whether a model is complex? We can create nice plots and then have an intuition whether it's complex or not. But how do we formalize that? A graph doesn't help us if we try to optimize something. We want to make regularization part of our objective in model estimation. We need more than a graph. We need a measure. Um, and let's, let's try to get, a, get the gist of these measures by looking at, at these examples here. We have two linear regression models, and I want you to tell me which one is simpler out of the two. And obviously, you will have an intuition, but I also like you to think about this intuition and then explain why you believe that the left model or the right model is the simpler one. We essentially have something like uh, y hat equals to beta o, and that is it. Whereas here we have y hat equal beta o plus beta 1 times x, the second model. 
And you say the first one is simpler. Less terms, you say. Very true, less terms. Uh, less parameters, you, you could also say. Terms, parameters, um, the, the beta is a parameter. And model estimation is about finding values for the parameters. So model estimation is, is easier if you just need one parameter. Or a model having just one parameter is simpler than a model having more than one parameter. Makes very good sense. And it's obviously entirely correct. So, um, what's the, the takeaway then? Parameters matter. The number of the parameters has something to do with complexity. More parameters, more degrees of freedom, more flexibility, i.e. we can model more complicated scenarios. So the model is more complex. You could look at that from a more formal perspective. You could look at it from the perspective of the bias variance trade-off. The formula that you see here is just a decomposition of the squared error. Note how, how this bit here is um, it's SE, squared error, right? I will, to be honest, I was a bit sloppy with, with my notation by not formally introducing it, but you see this F hat, which is our estimate. Uh, and it depends on x, so this is basically the, the regression function, for example, that we construct. And we look at its residuals by comparing the estimate from our regression function to the true values y, we square these, and the expectation of that is the squared error. And we can decompose this squared error into multiple terms. And if you want to see the formal proof, look up one of these uh, videos where you can find the formal proof and convince yourself that this equation does make sense. And in a nutshell, we say, uh, or we see two terms, bias and variance, which also gave the name to this nice decomposition or trade off. So we can show proof that error, squared error to be precise, is a function of two evils. One is bias and the other is variance. Either one drives error. The higher the bias, the higher the error. The higher the variance, the higher the error. And as a matter of fact, it turns out that there is a trade-off between the two, bias and variance. That's not immediately noticeable from the equation, I believe. Uh, so let's look at that. Um, Let's first come up with these nice graphical examples. This is a, a setting where we have low bias and low variance. So we always really hit the bullseye. Here we have high variance, but there is low bias. And here we have high bias and low variance. And lastly, we have high bias and high variance meant to give you an intuition what we talk about. I mean, okay, we don't throw darts or don't shoot arrows. We try to construct predictive models, so we need one more translation. Um, that looks more familiar to us. We have a linear model, which given data that exhibits this degressive functional shape, has a high bias. It's bias. It does not capture the true dependency between x and y. This is why it is biased. It's too simple. The relationship between x and y is not rightfully captured by a line. But our linear model is only able to fit a line. It can't do more than that. And because the line is not enough, the model has a bias. Expressive power is insufficient to capture the true relationship between x and y. I'm just trying to say the same thing in different words to give you the sense of it. And in the other example, we have no bias. The model fits our data with perfection, but it's very variable. 
very flexible, too flexible, really. Um, you could imagine a minor change to your data sample. You reestimate the model from the data sample after maybe adding a few points or deleting a few points, and out of a sudden, the model that you get looks completely different. It's very high variance, or it is a signal of high variance, of, let's say, the notion of variance. And both is bad, as we have seen from the bias variance decomposition. Both is bad because it drives your error. So then, um, there is the trade-off between the two, and it turns out that the more complex the model, the less bias it has, but the more variance it has. The less complex the model, the more bias it has, but the less variance it has. This is what motivates these functional shapes that you see here depicted. Bias decreases with complexity, variance increases with complexity. These functional shapes are just, you know, guesstimated. Uh, don't put too much attention to the functional shapes. However, in tendency, these shapes are correct, and they mean that there is a sweet spot. Something where the ratio between bias, or the relation between bias and variance is just right. Where you have the lowest error. And this clearly holds true if you think of error in terms of squared error, but similar types of decompositions also exist for other type of error measures. That's just that they are maybe a little bit more complicated to handle. Squared error has some nice properties, which is why I was looking at it, but the same tendency applies to other type of error measures, and certainly it also applies to any type of model that bias and variance are both bad, raise your error, and exhibit a trade-off. So regularization, realizing that trade-off advocates an approach where you deliberately introduce bias to decrease variance. That is the idea. And the trade-off tells you that this can be beneficial. It can work out. If your model is too complicated and the bias is so high, that's nonsense. Um, if um, the, the, the model is too complicated and the variance is, is too high, constraining the model a little bit, like pulling it back, can raise your performance, can reduce your error, because the additional benefit that you get from reducing this enormous amount of variance might overcompensate the negative, the adverse effect of introducing some bias. And this is what regularization is doing. You add a penalty, a complexity penalty to your model, thereby you introduce a bias, and then you estimate the model together with this penalty to balance between bias and variance. That is the, the overall idea, and I'll just sketch that uh, for the case of regression models, where uh, you were telling me earlier on that for regression models you believe that complexity is a function of the number of parameters, of course rightfully so, and uh, let me add to that the complexity of a regression model is also a function of the magnitude of the parameters. So a model with more parameters is more complex, but if we have two models and they have the same type of parameters, the one which has larger beta values in absolute terms also is more complicated, and this motivates these type of penalties. Uh, the lasso penalty or the rich penalty, they basically add up the coefficients that you have in your regression functions, either in squared terms or in absolute terms. And you see um, elastic net is a special way which integrates both of them. We don't have time to look into the relative merits and demerits. Um, lasso and rich are the more popular type of penalties. Elastic net penalty, a bit more powerful. Uh, let's not go there. The key thing is that you take these penalties and you add this to your model. I just reproduced the model formulation of logistic regression as linear regression as the log odds. Check uh, the loss function that we looked at, the negative of the likelihood, which we want to minimize. 
That's our loss function, and we want to estimate our model, find the betas by minimizing this loss function. But now we change the whole picture and introduce something new. This is a new bit. We not only have our likelihood function, we also add this penalty, either as a rich penalty or as a lasso penalty. That's, oh, you, you have it here, that's rich. And this is a typo, apologies, there is need for another revision. That's the lasso penalty. You add these penalty terms, and when you fit the model, you minimize both the training error and the complexity measured in terms of the magnitude of your beta. And you, well, you can convince yourself that this minimization of the magnitude of the betas, or, well, similarly, their number, reduces the complexity of your model. So these regularized regression techniques combine empirical risk minimization with complexity considerations and try to come up with a model that fits the training data well, but also is similar. The cost of that is we have this additional parameter lambda here, and this is not a parameter, but a meta-parameter. It's something that you must set before you can estimate your model. You must decide on a value for lambda, and typically you will need to tune that empirically and at this point, I just refer to the tutorial uh, where we do these things, or you have already briefly looked into that. Okay, so thanks a lot for your attention. Sorry for the slight delay. Until next week.